Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus the Tribble. So the question is, what the heck is an electret? Now I've asked this question to several people over the past week uh, and they said all sorts of interesting things like an elect pet? Is that some sort of like new electronic gizmo? Uh, an elect fret? Something to do with a guitar? And he said, no, 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 an electret. And of course nobody knew what the heck this was. So what is it? <clears throat> well, uh, in order to explain that, let's think about magnets. Uh, everybody knows what a magnet is, right? You got your North Pole, you got your South Pole. Um, you take two of these things, you put them close to each other, and depending on the orientation of the poles, they either repel or they attract. You know, magnetism is used in everything. You got fridge magnets. Everybody understands magnets, right? Well, an electret is essentially an electric magnet, which is to say uh, it's, it's a it's a Instead of a, a chunk of uh, usually iron type metal that generates a magnetic field, an electret is a chunk of material that generates a permanent electric field. Okay, so now just as with uh, a magnet, you have your north and south poles, with uh, electrets, they have their own uh, sort of positive and negative end and they generate their own electric field and the same rules of attraction and repulsion apply. Uh, opposite charges attract, like charges repel, Bob's your uncle. Now, if you're a bit confused here, you don't remember, you know, your high school physics and everything, uh, what's the difference between a magnetic and an electric field? Well, electromagnetism is all about electric and magnetic fields, movement of charge, blah, blah, blah. So let's just consider a simple circuit here. Uh, you have, uh, it's two, basically two wires, and at the top end you have a battery with a plus and minus, it's generating voltage, and at the bottom end you have a resistor, that little gray cube. A resistor, remember, is just a, it just resists the flow of electricity, so when, when juice flows through it, it dissipates the power from the battery in the form of heat. So it's kind of like, you know, one of the simplest circuits you can come up with. So when you connect the battery, current flows through the two wires towards the resistor, and this generates a magnetic field, uh, as you can see on the left, those red lines, it's sort of like uh, loops of magnetic force around the wires. On the right, we have these yellowish lines. That's what the electric field looks like. Because you have a battery with a plus and minus, uh, one, one of the wires is plus, the other wire is minus, and so between those two plus and minus charges, essentially, you get what is known as an electric field. And you may notice that the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, so this is kind of nifty. I mean, who knew that y you can have a permanent magnet, you can also generate a magnetic field, you can also have a permanent electret that generates an electric field. Like, who knew? I didn't know. So, well, what actually are electric, like, what are they made of? Like, how, how do you make one? Well, uh, as opposed to magnets, which are usually, you know, like iron, iron oxide, different types of, you know, basically metals, uh, you take the metal, uh, you can either, there's several ways to make magnets. You can take an existing strong magnet, rub it on this magnetizable material, and you'll turn the other thing into a magnet. Sometimes they apply like a, a giant current, or they, they melt certain metals, and then in the presence of a really strong magnetic field, the metal hardens again, and voila, it becomes another permanent magnet. Electrets are a little bit different because they generally consist of insulating material, kind of like the take your balloon and your, your piece of wool and rub them and you get an electric charge, insulating materials. So uh, usually the way you form an electret, the very first ones were made of uh, two different types of wax and rosin. Rosin is actually resin with the the kind of like the, the evil, what do you call it? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, Chemi the volatile chemicals kind of boiled off and so it ends up being this kind of translucent paste that's rosin. So you take two types of wax like carnauba wax, beeswax, and rosin and you melt them together say like in a little cylinder of like this shape and then while it's molten you take two plates positive, negative and as assume that I am a high voltage source instead of a high current source I'm I'm producing uh, several thousand volts per centimeter. So let's say um, I am the 30,000 volt generator, DC, 30,000 volts. Here's the positive terminal, here's the negative terminal, right? So you take that molten wax plus rosin and you put it here and you put it between these plates 
30,000 volts or whatever, and the voltage actually causes the polar molecules in the molten wax to align. Now, a polar molecule is simply, uh, you can think of like water as a polar molecule, like, you know, the oxygen is negative, the hydrogen side is the positive, the two hydrogen atoms, and because the water molecule is bent, it has a positive and a negative end. That's what a polar molecule is. So in the case of this wax and rosin mixture, there are polar molecules inside, so when that 30,000 volt field is applied, you get an electric field, like arrows, going from one plate to the other, and it goes through that material, and it takes all those polar molecules, and it orients them to the field so that all their pluses and minuses are aligned, and voila, when the waxy, rosiny stuff cools, you end up with a, a chunk of material that has its own permanent electric field. Um, yeah, so that's it. That's how you make an electret. Now, modern electrets are usually made of certain types of plastic, like PTFE and stuff, and it's usually like a very thin film. You can like fire, like with an electron beam, you fire electrons at the plastic, and blah, there's all kinds of fancier ways they do it. Uh, electrets can hold their charge for up to a hundred years. So, yeah, they're, they're generally called meta-stable, like meta-permanent, but, I mean, a hundred years, they're pretty much, it's a permanent electric field. And as with magnets, like, if you whack a magnet really hard, you can demagnetize it. If there's another super intense magnetic field, you can demagnetize the magnet, and so on and so forth. The same is true of electrets. It's not, like, permanent-permanent, it's relatively permanent. So, the question is, why have you never even heard of electrets? And that's actually a very good question. Now, many people actually have heard of them, but they just don't remember it, and that's in the form of what is known as an electret microphone. You might have, you know, looked this up on Google and go, oh yeah, it's like one of those little dinky microphones. Yeah, that's because electret microphones use usually a thin film. It's like a film and a capacitor and blah blah blah, and it's this permanent electric field that forms an integral part of essentially why this type of microphone works. But other than that, um, you probably have never heard of electrets. And I myself thought that an electret microphone was simply some particular type of microphone. And it is, but I didn't know that it actually uses these things called electrets to work. And they don't really teach this stuff in universities. Uh, I spent five and a half years getting two electrical engineering degrees, and I don't remember one single occasion in any physics or engineering course where electret, the word, was even mentioned. So that's pretty weird. Um, and I guess kind of the reason is that you don't hear about this is because electrets are sort of part of what is known as electrostatics, which is the study of things like lightning and static electricity and electrets and uh, sort of electric, electric and electric field related gizmos. And most of our technology, when we talk about, you know, electromagnetism, we think more like currents flowing, magnetic fields, AC induction motors, um, you know, it, electric fields apply to things like a printed circuit board, like a motherboard and a processor, and but we're kind of more concerned with, like, you've got electrons flowing as currents and you're turning them on and off to get ones and zeros, and sure, you have to worry about the electric fields, but it's like, nah, it's, it's kind of not so important. So that's just kind of like how our technology evolved. Uh, but electrostatics is uh, actually a in my opinion, an undervalued field of study, and if you want a good introduction to it, you should read A.D. Moore's book, Electrostatics. Uh, this is the second edition. It has um, plans for building what is called, he, he calls it the die rod motor. These are electric motors uh, that are essentially powered by electric charge and electric fields, not magnetic fields. Um, of course, when you have an electric field, you have a magnetic field, yeah, right. The whole thing is, if you want to have an introduction to electrostatics, read this guy's book. Uh, it was written in, I think, the 60s or 70s. It's very old. Um, he was an awesome dude, and his book is kind of like an introduction to electrostatics for the layperson. Like, he explains everything very, uh, you know, he builds on it and explains things slowly and gradually, and pretty much anyone can understand and even build some of these electrostatic motors if you want. Um, it's an excellent introduction to the subject. Now, the interesting thing about elect electrostatic motors is uh, there are some that do use electrets in the same way that you can use permanent magnets to make a motor or a generator. You can actually use electrets that have a permanent electric field to make motors and generators. Um, the difference of these motors is typically they are made of not like coils of wire and chunks of metal 
and conducting things, they are typically made of more uh, insulators such as plexiglass and glass and sometimes they include some little conductive strips. Um, but they are usually very small, very lightweight, made of insulating materials like plastics, uh, and they are generally powered by very high voltages but very low currents, which is kind of the opposite of all the stuff we use nowadays, like, you know, if you have a, a pump, you know, you plug it into your wall, AC, 120, 230 volts, the voltage is much lower and the current is much higher. So, um, for a magnetic motor, lower voltage, higher current. For an electrostatic motor, very, very high voltage and teeny, teeny, tiny currents usually. So usually these motors are very low power, but there is another book that you may want to read. And this one is actually super awesome. And it is Electrostatic Motors, new revised edition by Oleg Jefimenko. Uh, I have a hard copy here because it is not available on Kindle. And this is a very interesting book. This is another guy. He was Ukrainian. He ended up uh, moving to the U.S., was like a professor, uh, I forget which university. Um, he also, kind of like A.D. Moore, he got into electrostatics, kind of like, you know, before retirement, but he really got into it afterwards, I guess. And uh, he actually claims that electrostatic motors with a power output of up to 100 watts have been made. And now that's much, much higher power output. Uh, and then he says something uh, pretty interesting. Uh, he talks about a compound corona motor. This is a type of electrostatic motor using electric fields and the movement of charge for motion and not, not worrying about the magnetic side. And for this particular type of compound motor that consists of sort of sandwiched plates, it's, you can read the book and see how it works if you want. It's a little bit too complicated to explain in this video. He says, of this type of motor, there are indications that compound motors of this type can develop up to 1,000 horsepower for each cubic meter of their volume. And I'm going like, I just read two entire books, this is like the end of his, and he's going, suddenly he springs it on me, yeah, we built ones that are like up to 100 watts output, I'm like, well, my, I got a table fan, like, you know, right next to me, it's like 50, 60 watt motor, like, that's not nothing. The previous motors in the books were like on the order of like microwatts or something, a tiny, tiny power outputs barely useful to do any work. And then he springs it, he says, oh, 100 watts. And then he says, a one cubic meter motor of this type could output 1,000 horsepower, according to his calculations. Now, he hasn't actually built one. This was only theoretical. And as far as I know, he passed away and never got around to it. But I did a quick calculation because I said, well, 1,000 horsepower for each cubic meter of their volume. Wait a minute. One cubic meter is 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters. 100 times 100 times 100 is a million cubic centimeters. Divide by a thousand and you get a motor that's 10 centimeters on a side or a, a cube that's four inches on all size, sides. So uh, a, a four, four inch by four inch by four inch cube motor made electrostatic motor, compound corona motor like he's talking about, could output one horsepower. Now, I don't know um, if you know much about motors, but if you have, say, like a pool, maybe you have a, a pump, you know, to filter the water, you're talking one horsepower motor, you're talking about a big honking heavy thing that, like, weighs a lot. And he's saying he can make an electrostatic motor that's about this big that would output the same amount of power and it would weigh a maximum of three pounds, which is like 1.7 kilos or 1.3 kilos, something like that. So, right, I'm um, going to have to read more about this, look into this guy's work maybe a little bit more, but um, yeah, there, there's, uh, that's what an electret is, anyway, uh, and that led me into this whole electrostatics thing, which is just becoming more and more interesting by the minute. So, um, if you do want to learn a little bit more about this, like I said, first read A.D. Moore's book, because that's an excellent introduction, and then... Um, this one is also uh, very, very good. It's by Oleg Jefimenko. Uh, I have more to read, so I'll probably be making more videos on electrostatics soon. But I just wanted to explain what an electret is. I was completely blown away when I read about it. Uh, there's even an entry on Wikipedia, and they're like, oh, this is what an electret is. And I went like, what? And then I read these books, and I'm going like, how come we don't use these motors? Like, you know. So anyway, I just thought that was furiously interesting, and I thought you might enjoy it. Um... Read the books. Fascinating. For more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.